So hello everybody, my name is Agnes Kish and uh, today we are going to speak about a Hungarian book called The Fury of the Tsar, written by Attila Demko, who used to be the director of defense policy and a security policy expert for the Hungarian Ministry of Defense and the Prime Minister's office. And he held these positions for some 20 years. But uh, recently he wrote a book about Hungarian history and the specific part of Hungarian history, which is the Trianon Treaty and the, the 100 years after the Trianon Treaty. In 1918, after the First World War, the Trianon Treaty cut up Hungary into many, many parts and two-thirds of the territory of the country was taken away by the surrounding countries, which left some two-thirds of the population, most of which were of Hungarian nationality, outside the current borders. Uh, and what is interesting about this book is that it deals with the topic through a Russian point of view or a Russian uh, political angle, so to say. And that's why the title is The Fury of the Tsar. Why is Putin on the cover of the book? So, uh, Russia is very much interested in dividing the West. Hungary is a member of NATO, uh, and many of the surrounding countries are members of both NATO and EU. But these issues, what happened uh, 100 years ago, that so many Hungarians became citizens of these countries, are still a lingering tension, and Russia is watching this. If you look what Russia did in Ukraine or Georgia, in both countries, uh, they, used, uh, they used minority issues to divide uh, these countries. And they are also looking at the Hungarian communities in the neighboring countries who are not really uh, welcome citizens in Romania, Slovakia, Ukraine, and, and, and less so, but also in Serbia. And they are um, definitely trying to use this to divide and uh, conquer NATO and the European Union. This is one of their tools that the other is energy. They, they have many tools. Mm -hmm. They are using it now in a low-key uh, manner. We are looking at it. They are manipulating at it. But in Ukraine, there was an explosion by a Russian uh, agent at the Hungarian Cultural Institute uh, mm -hmm. back in 18, after my book was published. Mm -hmm. by the Hungarian so it version. happened recently. Yeah, it happened. Uh, my book in Hungarian was published in 18, the March of 18, and uh, and that incident in uh, in um, the Zakarpatskoye Oblast, which was used to be part of Hungary, at the Hungarian Cultural Institute, happened in in the February of 18. So just before yes. my book was published, but I wrote about how how the Russians are using these incidents. So uh, this is, I think, an interesting topic not only for the Hungarian reader, but uh, I think it's interesting globally how Russia is using these issues and how these issues can be very effective as a tool to divide uh, the Western community. So on the one hand, we can learn about the Russian way of thinking, in fact, which is a way of thinking that they use elsewhere as well, not just uh, in respect to the Hungarian situation. And in the, in the second part of the book, you write about Hungarian history. Can you describe for a non-Hungarian reader what they can learn about the current Hungarian situation? One part of the book is from the point of view of, of the Tsar, who is, uh, let's say, based on Vladimir Putin, his thinking, and the Russian, why the Russians feel the way they are feeling towards the West. They are very much hurt by some things the West did, mm -hmm. and they are not doing this all without a reason. So I explain the Russian point of view. And the other is, um, in the other part of the book, I try to be neutral. Of course, I'm Hungarian. I try to explain why there are problems between the Hungarians and the neighboring countries. And, uh, and I try to uh, tell that this is, for much of the Hungarians, this is now an issue of survival as a people as a culture in Ukraine or in Slovakia or in, in Romania. It happened 100 years ago when these territories were detached from Hungary without a vote, without any democratic decision. And even today, uh, more than 2 million Hungarians live in these areas. Altogether, we have 10 million people in Hungary, so 2 million is a very big number. 
Hundreds of thousands had to escape, more than half a million had to escape to Hungary as refugees in the last 100 years from Transylvania, from Slovakia, and many tens of thousands were killed. And this is an unknown story in the West. Very, very few people know about this, but it should be known. But again, the Hungarian part of the story is, is one line. Uh, the other is uh, the Russian, how the Russians are manipulating this. But I also write about how the Americans use these tools in the Balkans. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive book. The Hungarian story is one part of it. The Balkan story, the Balkan war story is another part, which is about Bosnia, how the Bosnian war was manipulated mostly by the Americans. And the other story is the Russian side of the story, the Russian mindset and why Mr. Putin is so angry, why he's furious. That's the main question. And if, if somebody reads the book at the end, he will get the answer why he is so furious and why he wants his revenge taken on the West. Mm -hmm. So, so one part of the story is the international uh, political kind of manipulation on, on both sides. But of course, uh, you show this through the Hungarian situations. What kind of personal Hungarian stories are there behind these manipulations or maybe as an outcome of these manipulations? Well, you know, I write, uh, for example, about how Hungarians celebrate certain days and f days of freedom and how these are not welcome in, in certain neighboring countries and such events can be used also by nationalist forces in the neighboring countries but also by Russia to manipulate the situation. I wrote the book in, before 2018 and such incidents happened since then. It yeah, was and, and an interesting event in the book is something similar that happened just a few weeks ago in the valley of the Ouz River, this uh, Romanian provocation. How could you foresee that something like this would happen? Well, history is, is contested in this region. Uh, and, uh, and history is alive. Uh, so it's not the past. We, we talk about what happened at the end of First War in most countries like the past. In this region, this is the present. Because the... Um, the borders were forced upon many countries. Yugoslavia was created and it fell apart in, in a bloodbath just uh, 20 years ago. Hungary was created the way it is after the end of the First World War. Czechoslovakia fell apart. So this is current history. And how could I um, foresee such a thing? I think these things are happening all the time. I mean, low-level violence is happening all the time between Hungarians and Romanians, between Hungarians and um, Serbs and Slovaks. This is happening all the time. I was myself surprised that this incident was so close to being a very serious bloody incident. Um, I thought that, that uh, the Romanian authorities know better. It was very close to be a very, very violent and bloody conflict between the local Hungarians and the Romanian protesters and also between Hungary and Romania. What are the similarities and the differences between the situations of the Hungarian minorities in the different surrounding countries? Well, I, uh, I think uh, um, each country is different. I think the most problematic and the most deep-seated problem is the Hungarian-Romanian problem. So actually, what Romania got from pre-war Hungary, pre-first world Hungary, is a bigger area than Hungary itself today, yeah. uh, which is uh, quite outstanding that 3 million Romanians got a bigger area from an old Hungary than, than 10 million Hungarians. So you can imagine how, how this uh, treaty was and not really recognizing the self-determination of mm -hmm. people. I would say that uh, in the past 30 years, the worst in many ways was Serbia, and those parts of Croatia which were occupied by the Serbs, because there, there were, there were massacres of mm -hmm. Hungarians also, not only Croats and Bosnians. N nobody ever heard about the Hungarians, but several Hungarian villages were raised to the ground by Serbian forces between 1991 and 95. And I write about that. Which is quite recent history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we talk about hundreds of people killed, not tens of thousands like in Bosnia, but hundreds of Hungarians were killed. So previously it was the worst in Serbia, now the best in Serbia. Uh, from all these neighboring countries. Slovakia is interesting. Uh, the, the conflict is more deep, not so obviously on the surface, but it's there. Ukraine used to be very good, but with the rise of Ukrainian nationalism after the 2014 events at the Maidan, 
and the new laws introduced by Ukraine, the previously very good relations started to deteriorate. So I would say that today um, the worst situation in many ways are in Ukraine, economically definitely, but also as, as treatment of the community Ukraine is starting to be the worst. Then Romania, uh, then Slovakia, and unfortunately I can say I talked about alliance and, uh, and being one together in the EU. Uh, Romania and Slovakia treated the Hungarians well until they were not part of NATO, until they needed our Hungarian support to join NATO. And in the case of Romania, they needed Hungarian support to join the European Union. So until, yes. until we had the promises how there will be a Hungarian university for and now, today, these, these promises are forgotten. After Hungary delivered its part and supported Romania in many ways to join the West, Romania forgot most of its promises, unfortunately. Something similar happened after the Trianon Treaty as well, when uh, most of the surrounding countries promised a lot of things, out of which uh, very little was... Uh, realized, so to say. <laughs> yes, for example, Romania uh, promised the equality for the Hungarian community. And the first thing they did when they entered Transylvania was the abolishment of the Hungarian university, uh, second class status for the Hungarian language. The promises made to the, to the then great powers, to France, uh, Great Britain and the United States by Romania were broken basically in the first moment when this territory became uh, Romania. And the promises made to us before Romanian joining of NATO and the EU, most of these promises, especially the university, was, uh, not, was not kept. And we have spoken about the past and the present. How about the future? Well, this is the issue. We are in a very uncertain time. So I think we have to be very cautious and we have to talk honestly about these issues. So that's, uh, that's what I do in this book. This is a very tough book. This tells, this, this, it, I saw the, how things happen in the world for 20 years. So I traveled around the world, I negotiated uh, from one end of the world to the other. So I, I think that it's, it's underestimated how problematic this issue is in the West. How can it blow up very easily the way Yugoslavia blew up? So I cannot predict the future, but definitely it's a volatile region with a lot of historical problems, with no good answers. European Union did not answer uh, the question of minorities, the question of, uh, let's say, how to... There, there is an answer for every minority, but not for the national minorities yes. in, in Europe. And the future, I hope that we can discuss these issues openly between Hungary and the neighboring countries. And I hope that we can talk about these issues in the West, because it's the interest of all of us not to be used by others, manipulated by others for, for their own good. Hungary, Romania, Slovakia and Ukraine would be much stronger if we could, uh, if we could sit down and we could discuss these issues. But again, my book is uh, The Fury of the Tsar is, is more than that. It's about, also about Russia, how I, Russia is behaving like that, because we have to talk to Russia. We have to understand Russia. And if you say that Russians are only manipulating and aggressive, we have to ask the question, why? And that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing, asking in the book, and I'm answering why the Tsar is furious, because he has reasons to be furious with the West. Yeah, and let's remember that what happened to Hungarians or what is happening to Hungarians might happen to others if these issues are not discussed. Yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can compare this situation maybe to, to what is in Canada between the French and the English between the Quebecois. And the, so that's, this is a similar issue, but Canada is giving rights and not taking away rights, and Romania was promised... How about Ireland and the UK? Northern Ireland, I can, I can, I can, if, if the Western re, uh, reader or listener... The Basques, for example. Yeah, this is, this is very similar to these situations, but until now there was very limited violence. But we talk about uh, millions of people, so this issue is, should be more known, um, because if there is a trouble in Northern Ireland, that's for Ireland and the UK, this issue, but if there is a trouble between Romania and, and Hungary, that's an issue for at least for this region, for a dozen countries, because mm -hmm. the impact would be would be very very big. Yeah, because this is a region of the collision between the West and the East. That's what my book is about: the collision between the East and the West, and how how our peaceful little world can break up if the problems of national minorities are not solved. 
this is not going to be solved in one year and it can be a conflict like in, the, in Yugoslavia, largely in Northern Ireland, a conflict for decades or like in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.